So, the function list is coming along and responding to the mind-brain identity theorist's claims as well. Uh, so Kripke has his argument against the mind-brain identity theory, but the functionalists come along and they've also got arguments against it. And they've also got a proposal for a new way of thinking about the mind. So in a way like the behaviorists uh, said that we were making a category mistake when we asked what the mind is at all, the functionalists are saying something similar. They're saying, we're kind of making an error in thinking about what uh, the mind might be as a thing. What we need to do is think about, um, not what it's made out of, like the identity theorist is claiming, but what it does. What does the mind do? Now, there are lots of things like this. Uh, so if you have a clock, and I ask you, what, what, how, what's a clock? Let's come up with a, a definition of a clock. And you have a clock, maybe that, like that red one there, and it's made out of plastic or something. And you say, well, I have a clock here, it's plastic, and it has black hands and it's red, right? Well, I can come along with another example of a clock, like the one on the lower right, the digital clock, and I say, well, mine isn't red, and it's not plastic, it's maybe made out of wood or something, and other uh, components. So how are these things clocks, right? The identity theorists would be in trouble if they were going to make some analogous claim here about uh, a clock is, it just is what it's composed of, the is of composition, right? That would be weird. You'd say, no, that's not what's important to being a clock. What's important to being a clock is what a clock does. It keeps accurate track of the time. You could build any bizarre device that might not even be recognizable as a clock unless you trained somebody how to read it. Uh, nevertheless, it kept very accurate track of the time and there would be a way of extracting that information from it. And that would count as a clock, even if it took up 10 square miles, or uh, the size of our solar system, or was the size of an atom, okay? Um, and was made out of anything. As long as it performed that function, it would be a clock. Simple, okay. So the identity theorist is making this claim um, that you are your brain, and that mental states are identical to brain states. So, classic paradigm examples of mental states uh, sensory experiences like pain, uh, phenomenal experiences, uh, beliefs and desires. So take a belief. The belief that Dublin is the capital of Ireland. We'll represent that here just by B uh, for belief. So the identity theorist's claim is that, remember now, this is a type, type claim. And I mentioned this a few times. So whenever that type of belief is going to be instantiated uh, it's going to be instantiated by uh, C fibers firing. So that type of belief is identical to that type of neural state or process. Okay. Now here, uh, and I've mentioned this a few times in, in the last lecture, <clears throat> we need to distinguish between types and tokens. So a simple way of doing it, look, uh, we can represent a type here. This is the type, a symbol I'm going to use just arbitrarily for, this, for the type cat. Okay, and this is a symbol for the type dog. Okay, now obviously uh, we can have many different tokens of that type. There are many individual cats, and each individual cat is a token of the type or the kind cat. And similarly, of course, for dogs, lots of individual tokens of the type dog. Now, the type neural identity theorist like SMART, uh, is making claim uh, about a type, uh, a type of mental state, let's say the belief that Dublin is the capital of Ireland, uh, and they're saying it's identical to a certain um, neural state or process. Wherever it occurs and whoever has that belief, it's going to be the same type of neural state. So uh, I have the belief that Dublin is the capital of Ireland, and in my case, uh, I'm going to have C fibers firing, but I originally put these slides together last year when I was teaching in Florida, and uh, there was still some chance that Hillary Clinton would be elected. I haven't got a chan chance to change the picture here, but uh, so here's Hillary Clinton. And she has the belief also that Dublin is the capital of Ireland. Now, in my case, that's C fibers firing, and if the type identity theorist is correct, then in the case of anyone else who has that belief, it's also uh, C fibers uh, firing. And that's what their identity claim consists in. Wherever that belief occurs, uh, it is 
constituted of, composed of, and identical to, in the strong sense, C fibers firing. Now the problem with this claim first comes from, you can kind of do it stepwise, it first comes from the phenomenon of neural plasticity. So it seems like when certain areas of a person's brain are damaged and there's a correlation established between a certain uh, function, a certain type of uh, say mental state or process and that part of the brain, and that part of the brain gets damaged, very often uh, those mental processes seem to be uh, reliably underpinned uh, by some other part of the brain. It takes over uh, the ability to do that, right? And so you can imagine at least theoretically here uh, that let's say poor Hillary's uh, C fibers got damaged somehow uh, and so she still had the belief that Dublin is the capital of Ireland uh, but now they're underpinned by B fibers, right? Now here that's enough in a way to show uh, that if that is, were true, or could be true, which it seems like it is true, uh, then the type, type identity theory can't be right. It sort of devolves immediately to a token neural identity. It says that whenever you have a token of the belief, uh, Dublin is the capital of Ireland, it's identical to some token neural state, but not a type of neural state. Just some token neural state. Maybe C fibers firing, maybe B fibers firing, and the problem gets worse, of course, when we uh, imagine that we find extraterrestrials someday, uh, aliens. They also believe uh, that Dublin is the capital of Ireland. They've been investigating the geography of uh, the planet Earth, and they're interested in coming here as tourists. And they think, yes, Dublin is the capital of Ireland. I'm going to go there. And that belief is instantiated by z, uh, z fibers firing, maybe. OK, so we've got all of these. Uh, different brain states now um, underpinning the same token belief. At least they're all neural states, so we can have a token, token um, mental state neural identity theory. Or can we? Well, maybe not, because presumably, uh, even though we might have all of these neural uh, token identities, we might want to allow for the possibility of artificial intelligence. And so, take the example of the operating system Samantha from the movie Her. Um, now, whatever about having a mental state like pain, it certainly seems that we can attribute the belief to Samantha that Dublin is the capital of Ireland, uh, even though she has no brain and therefore no neural processes or states. Uh, and that belief will presumably be uh, instantiated in silicon, say. So now, look, we don't even have token, token neural identity uh, theory, we just have a uh, token, token uh, physical identity. So every mental state is identical to some physical state. But now think about how watered down that claim is. The type type identity theory was really strong. And now this claim seems really weak. Think about how weak it is. The belief that Dublin is the capital of Ireland is identical to some physical state where that could be a conjunction of C fibers or, or say a disjunction of C fibers or Z fibers or B fibers or silicon fibers or, 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 or endlessly, right? Because we don't know where the end would come. How many different ways um, the belief that Dublin is the capital of Ireland could be physically instantiated, even if there is an identity theory there that that uh, mental state is that physical state. But we don't even know anything about that mental state now because it's an endless disjunction, uh, an endless or, 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 or um, various different physical states. We don't know anything. So it's a very watered down claim. Okay, so um, Hilary Putnam, uh, who proposed this general problem for the identity theory and then tried to motivate a particular form of functionalism, He's pointing this out, and he points out that uh, the type identity theory here um, says something like any organism is in pain or any other mental state, like believing that Dublin is the capital of Ireland, if and only if, so it's both necessary and sufficient, uh, the following conditions. A, that it possesses a brain of a suitable uh, physical chemical structure, and B, its brain is in that physical chemical structure, right? But we've seen that that disallows for all of these different possibilities. And so take the example of pain. And uh, some evil person comes along, 
uh, and uh, without warning me, jabs me with uh, a needle and ouch, I'm in pain. Okay, that's fine. But the problem is if we make that mental experience uh, identical to a type of neural state, then we rule out all of these um, species dependent variations. If you have uh, a different brain that doesn't have C fibers, then according to the identity theorist, you can't be in pain. So an octopus maybe won't be in pain even when we stick needles into it, uh, despite the fact that it behaves as if it is in pain and it has a nervous system that would indicate that it should be able to feel pain, etc. Uh, likewise for the alien. Uh, no brain, let's say they uh, actually have silicon uh, in their heads and they don't have a brain at all. Uh, if you have no brain, then you can't experience pain. And that seems weird um, if you think that mental states might be underpinned by lots of different physical realization bases, which it seems reasonable to think. And so this is the argument from uh, multiple realizability, uh, which Putnam also calls uh, chauvinism. So multiple realizability of mental states. The argument is really simple here, thankfully. Okay, We don't have to go through some rigmarole like the Kripke argument this time, thankfully. So the argument just goes like this. Any mental kind uh, is multiply realizable by distinct physical kinds. Neural plasticity seems to indicate that. Uh, the idea that different species might uh, sometimes be in the same mental state indicates that. And the possibility that we might want to allow for uh, artificial intelligence to have beliefs and even desires, and who knows, maybe even pain, um, seems to indicate that. So a mental kind is multiply realizable in lots of different uh, physical things. But if a, a given mental kind is multiply realizable like that, uh, then it can't be identical, right, uh, to any specific physical kind, like C fibers firing. If you can realize the thing in lots of different bases, then it's not identical to any one. And so no mental kind is identical to any specific physical uh, kind, such as C fibers firing. And that's the argument. Why didn't Kripke think of that? It would have made life much easier, right? So multiple realizability seems to show that the type type identity theory uh, can't be right. Now, Putnam is also making a proposal here. He's saying, uh, instead of thinking like that, why not think about what it is that these mental states do, okay? So in the same way that a clock uh, is something uh, that just reliably tracks the passage of time uh, and that a heart might be functionally defined uh, as a system that circulates blood uh, in an organism, and so we might make a heart out of something else other than the stuff it's normally made out of, uh, we might have an artificial heart, as people have. Uh, but that doesn't take away from its being a heart. So it's functionally defined. What's important for being a heart, like for being a clock, is what it does. And so Putnam's proposal here is that we maybe should think something similar about mental states. We should think maybe that mental states are just something, okay, that plays a causal role with respect to inputs, outputs, and other mental states. That's going to include beliefs, uh, like Dublin is the capital of Ireland, desires, like I want to go uh, to Dublin, uh, or uh, sensory phenomenal states, like being in pain. Now, importantly for the uh, uh, functional, uh, functionalist is that they're going to say that these mental states can interact with each other. So uh, a belief and a desire might interact to cause action. Um, so it's a mental state is something that um, mediates, it, 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 it serves a causal role with respect to inputs, let's say information that you get or sensory input. Uh, other mental states, so you might have a belief that interacts with a desire, there's a causal role going on there, and then that belief and desire interacting in that way might issue in output, which is bodily behavior or action. Okay, so we can see fairly clearly how the functionalist move in general, we don't have much of an idea of it yet, but how it's differing from the identity theorist. They're saying it's not important what um, a mental state is made out of, it's more important is what it does, and that might be multiply realized in different systems. 
Now note how similar that is to the behaviors, to, where they're saying it's not important what the uh, mind is, um, that part is similar at least to the behaviorist. But something that's very different from behaviorism is that the behaviorist, uh, especially in the strong ontological form, says that really mental states don't exist, strictly speaking. Uh, the logical or analytical philosophical behaviorist uh, says, well, I don't know whether they exist or not, but they certainly don't have any place in a scientific theory. Uh, so we're just going to do everything in terms of behavioral dispositions, outwardly observable uh, behavior in principle. Uh, and so they dispense with appeal to internal mental states altogether. So the, the difference here is, as I just described it, you can have a causal role being mediated uh, uh, with respect to inputs to a system, outputs from the system. The behaviorist would be happy with that, but also between other internal mental states. And that's something uh, that the functionalist can uh, appeal to that the behaviorist just can't appeal to because they say that we shouldn't appeal to those things at all. So just to give a, a flavor of this, which will lead into Putnam's idea of machine functionalism, which is the particular kind of functionalism that he wants to motivate, um, there's a wonderful short article which I encourage you to look up and I should post on the Moodle site by Jerry Fodor, a famous American philosopher who died recently. Uh, he wrote it in the Scientific American, I think. So it was kind of not just a, it's not a heavy duty philosophical article, it's more accessible. It was back in the 70s. And he has this lovely example of uh, a vending machine, Coke machine. So let's say you encounter this object. It turns out it's a vending machine. You're thirsty, you can see that there's drinks inside it and you want to get them out. But you don't know how this thing works at all. So you do various things, you kick it, uh, you get like Homer Simpson and you start trying to reach inside and get the thing, uh, you shout at it, uh, and nothing happens, right? But you're keeping on pot prodding and poking this uh, entity to see what, how you might get the drinks out. Eventually, you dig inside your pocket because you notice there's a little slot on the thing, it seems to be the shape of something you've got in your pocket, namely uh, a dollar uh, coin. So you put in this coin into the slot and lo and behold, uh, a drink comes out. Wonderful. Well, this is great. Uh, it seems like we can now establish our first law of Coke machine behavior. And notice that this is an entirely behavioristic law. The behaviorists would be totally happy with this law. It's a very simple law. If you give the input one dollar, you get the output, give a Coke, right? And you can then ascribe a disposition, a behavioral disposition to this entity. You can say, this thing is disposed uh, to give you a Coke when in the presence of uh, a dollar coin put into it, right? Great. So you keep on experimenting. You say, well, that worked nicely, so maybe I'll just stick in another coin. You find you have a 50 cent coin in your pocket. You put that in, nothing happens, right? So you start shouting at it and so on. You do various things until eventually you put in another 50 cent coin. And this time, odd, nothing happened the first time you put in a 50 cent coin, but this time a Coke comes out. Erratic behavior, right? This thing gives you a Coke when you put in a 50 cent coin sometimes, but not at other times. But you keep on experimenting and you notice that every second time you put in a 50 cent coin, I mean, you're a very naive uh, experimentalist here, but in any case, uh, this is a toy example to illustrate the point. Every second time you put in a 50 cent coin, you get a Coke. But notice what has, has to happen here. The machine, in order for that to be true, must have some way of internally representing that since the last time uh, it dispensed a Coke, it has received a 50 cent coin. In order to know that when it receives another 50 cent coin, it can then give you a Coke. So we have to have something a bit more complex here for our second law of Coke machine behavior. So we have to have a table like this. S1 and S2 here represent uh, states, internal states of the machine. Uh, and then you've got different inputs. We'll bracket out kicking and everything like that. Didn't work anyway. So uh, when you give a dollar input, you get a Coke. That's fine. That's the, the behaviorist law stuck in there. Um, at the top, if you get a 50 cent coin um, and you're in the initial state, S1, you go to S2. And then when you get another 50 cent coin when you're in S2, you give a Coke and you go back to S1. And that 
uh, is a very simple way of representing what a vending machine actually does, which is somehow represent the fact that it has gotten uh, 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 a 50 cent coin since the last time it dispensed a Coke. And then, of course, you have to allow for uh, what happens when uh, you give a dollar input and it's already in state two. Well, there you have to give a Coke and you've gotten too much money, so you have to give back 50 cents uh, change and also go back to state one. So this is a very simple entity, of course, a vending machine, and this is a fairly simple set of uh, uh, laws describing its behavior. But the behaviorist, to show how impoverished the behaviorist view is in a way, the behaviorist view cannot even successfully describe the behavior of a vending machine. Because a vending machine has to have internal states to which we can appeal uh, in explaining its behavior as we've done here in a machine table. So, good luck in trying to uh, explain human behavior in purely behaviorist terms. So that's the difference between functionalism uh, and uh, behaviorism, because functionalism is going to be perfectly well able to appeal uh, to things like this, uh, where internal states are integral to how we describe and explain uh, the system. Okay, so you remember the joke from before, uh, you're fine, how am I? Uh, the main point here is just that uh, Modern functionalist psychology and cognitive science uh, has no problem with internal mental states, whereas behaviorism does. Okay, so we said a mental state is something that plays a causal role with respect to input, output, and other mental states. Um, here, the causal role um, of a mental state is the set of causal links uh, that it has with sensory input and also other input that you'll get as a me uh, from sensory input, like informational input of certain kinds, uh, other mental states, and behavioral output. And the causal role here is just a job description. Uh, what's the purpose of a given mechanism? So we define what it is to be a heart just by what it does, what its purpose is, and so you can have all kinds of plastic hearts here, uh, in addition to the ordinary hearts we have. Um, same for clocks. Uh, and of course, we can describe a vending machine in this way. Now, in exactly the way that I had a machine table up there for the vending machine, Putnam wants to uh, have a theory of human behavior and psychology uh, that is uh, exactly similar in a way. He wants to actually write out a machine table, as it were, for every um, human uh, mental state. So what you'll do here uh, is a kind of a... Um, iterative process of uh, ramsifying various sentences, where that just means doing something like this. So you say um, pain, and then you give a definition. You, the identity scientist is picking out a definition, how you define pain in a functionalist sense. You'll say pain is the state X such that X, and then blah, blah, blah. So what you're doing is very similar to what the behaviors did in trying to translate out mental terms very similar to what SMART did in the topic neutral analysis um, as part of identity theory, you're just replacing the mental state with a variable and then you're giving here a functional definition of it. So it'll be the state X such that X tends to be caused by bodily damage, uh, tends to cause the belief, I have it in bold there because it's another mental state of course, that one is in pain, tends to cause the desire to get out of the uh, situation, etc., etc., etc. Okay, um, and that'll be your functional definition of pain. Now, of course, what you're going to have to do is backtrack then and give functional definitions of belief, of desire, of anxiety, etc. And wherever those terms occur in your functional definition of uh, pain, you're going to have to plug in those functional definitions of those other um, mental state terms. So it's going to be very complicated, okay? But we can see how it would go, at least. And if you just sat down, it would be an arduous process. You could actually do it. And so the idea is here that you'd end up writing out, uh, like we had for our second law of Coke machine behavior, a complicated uh, machine, set of machine table uh, descriptions for human psychology. And that would be our theory of human psychology, in the same way that those, that machine table was a theory of Coke machine behavior. So the idea here is that um, Putnam is just, I won't read out all of this quote, uh, I'll post it afterwards, but he's basically making the same uh, claim here, that he wants to have a form of machine functionalism where, you know, if the machine, in this case our uh, mental uh, system, 
whatever it is, uh, is in state uh, SI and the input is X, Y, Z, then we um, uh, go, that should be go, sorry, uh, go to state T and give output A, B, C. So if you have tickling feathers, then you give laughter and writhing or whatever it is, right? So it's going to be a, a really complicated um, process, but it looks like at least it's one that would work here, whereas the behaviorist's method of trying to translate out the mental terms altogether uh, won't, especially because they've got to go making mental backflips, intellectual backflips, trying to avoid uh, appeal to internal mental states at all. Okay, now one thing that uh, is important here, uh, and I mentioned this in the intro unit too, uh, is that strictly speaking, at its broadest, most general level, uh, functionalism is uh, what I like to call a black box theory. All it says is that you've got inputs and behavioral outputs and you've got internal mental states which can causally interact with each other, right? Now what mediates all that is completely up for grabs. So I just want to point out that strictly speaking, one could be uh, a dualist functionalist where one says that the uh, relevant functions are facilitated by an immaterial soul inside the black box of our heads, so to speak. Nobody holds that view, but if somebody wanted to, they probably could. So, it's not always, the further details of a particular fu uh, functionalist story will depend on what uh, you are committed to thinking about the uh, uh, functions being mediated by. Uh, if you think they're mediated by an immaterial soul, then you're going to have to be a, a dualist uh, functionalist. If, like um, Putnam, you think that the relevant functions are served by a computational mechanism, and in particular, uh, a Turing machine, which is a simple um, computational mechanism, uh, then you're going to be a machine, what's called a machine functionalist. And that's the kind of functionalism that Putnam was trying to motivate. Uh, so mental states just are the machine table states, like the one we looked at for the Coke machine, uh, which could be, uh, which could constitute then a Turing machine. What's a Turing machine? Some of you who took my intro unit will remember, but just briefly for the rest of you. Uh, it's an abstract theoretical machine uh, intended to represent a simple computer. The important part is that uh, a universal Turing machine is going to be a Turing machine that can read uh, or uh, perform the functions of every other uh, possible Turing machine. Um, and what matters here is the machine table itself, which is what's over on the right here. You could make a, a, a Turing machine out of the thing on the left here, where you have the symbols on a tape and you've got a reader for them uh, and so on. But it's, the reason it's functionalist theory is it's not important what instantiates the machine table. Uh, what's important is the machine table description itself. Uh, and that could be made up by uh, lots of different kinds of objects. So that's why it's, um, it's functionalist. All, these machine table states are multiply realizable in the way that it seems our own mental states are as well. Okay, so that's the, the view that, that, um, that Putnam is trying to uh, push. There are more recent um, versions of that kind of view where uh, they, functionalists abandon the appeal or the reliance on uh, Turing machine uh, machine table states, but they still appeal uh, to some kind of idea uh, that the mind is a computer. So they, uh, they rely on a computationalism, which is roughly speaking the view that the mind is uh, essentially a computer, that uh, we have internal mental uh, symbols in some way over which there are uh, operators that, that uh, tell them how to work. Uh, and so the inputs and outputs here uh, are going to be symbolic uh, and maybe not purely symbolic because uh, uh, you get se sensory input uh, and you get behavioral output out of it. Um, so the, the main move is here just not to appeal to Turing machines uh, solely but to uh, have a broader idea of, of uh, computation. Now just to give you an idea, of, because it's going to be important for when we come back after the Easter break, two other types of functionalism uh, and the second of which is the one we're going to look at in more detail when we come back. But first, role functionalism. So you might think, well look, if mental states can be multiply realized in all kinds of different physical realization bases, then even in multiple different kinds of neural bases, then it's really difficult to see how you could have any 
laws at that physical level, say neural laws, laws of neuroscience that could describe human behavior. The relevant laws would seem to have to be at a higher level, at the actual level of psychological descriptions, stated as it were in terms of beliefs and desires and things like that. And so Jerry Fodor has this view where he argues for the autonomy of psychology as a science, that the laws of psychology are not derivable uh, from the laws of neuroscience. So in order to uh, fully describe uh, human mentality and human behavior, we need to have uh, autonomous psychology as a science where uh, we have laws that are stated at that level. Why? Well, because uh, those mental states can be implemented in all kinds of different brains, so how could we ever have one neuroscience that would describe them? Okay? We couldn't, if multiple realization is possible. So that's the role functionalist's view, and what we're going to look at when we come back is uh, a different kind of uh, functionalism that sort of ends up reverting a little bit to the identity theorist's idea, and that is realizer functionalism. So the realizer functionalist says, hang on a second, um, if you're a role functionalist and you think psychology is an autonomous science, then it seems like you're going to have to say that neuroscience just isn't interesting when it comes to the mind. But it seems like neuroscience really is interesting and it tells us a lot about the mind. And so the correlations that we're noticing between mental states and particular neural states, uh, even token states, let's say, uh, that are in human beings, seem to be important. And so uh, realizer functionalists will say, fine, we'll uh, define uh, the functional role uh, at, a, at the mental level in terms of beliefs and desires and everything, but then our theory is going to be grounded out in cognitive neuroscience uh, by looking at what those states described at the mental level are realized in, uh, in human brains. And so you can see that the realizer functionalist uh, is not going to be able to uh, allow for radical multiple realizability they might be able to allow for neuroplasticity within humans or something, so it's not a type-type identity claim. But they're not going to be able to, they're going to have to say, well, if you want to understand the behavior of octopuses or something, then we're going to have to have uh, octopus psychology um, that would be grounded in cognitive neuroscience of octopuses, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? So it's going to be limited to humans. Uh, but that's what we're going to look at when we come back. Now, just briefly, and this is obviously going to be like radically briefly because I've got what? three minutes left or something. The objection. Ned Block's objection to uh, functionalism. We'll talk about it more in the tutorial. I'm not going to read out this whole thing, but I'll post it here so that you've got the relevant uh, passage. The objection here is, uh, he uses a particular thought experiment. He says, okay, if all that's important for being uh, in a mental state, for a mental state to exist, is that uh, is the, this functionalist description, uh, then we might be able to realize that functionality in the same way that we make realize clocks out of all kinds of different uh, materials and uh, you could make a huge clock the size of uh, the planet or something uh, that looks very strange. Similarly, we might replicate various human mental states uh, by, he takes the population of China because at least it's big enough to possibly or plausibly um, uh, performed all of the functional roles that uh, our neurons do or something like that. Um, so he says, right, take the population of China and they've all got two-way radios and they're communicating with each other and there's a big satellite in the sky that everybody can see that gives them instructions. Um, and then you spell out the story so that it's supposed to be a functional, uh, all the causal roles with respect to input, output, and interaction between mental states that can occur by the two-way radios, etc. All of that it seems like you could implement, if you give a functional description uh, of uh, some mental state and a series of mental states, then you could implement all that in that machine that you've built here out of all the people in China, two-way radios and a satellite in the sky. But the question Bloch asks us then is, would that system, the entire system made up of the people, the two-way radios and the satellite, would it suddenly sort of spring into consciousness and go like, whoa, this is great, I'm suddenly alive, and this is wonderful. I like the view of the sky, by the way, or something, right? Um, it seems weird, he's suggesting at least, to think that that system 
uh, would now suddenly instantiate especially phenomenal states uh, like the experience of what it's like to see something uh, or the experience of pain. Uh, but strictly speaking, it seems like for the functionalist, that's all that's going on in any given mental state, then it's hard to see uh, why we shouldn't conclude that that thing could be. Um, now, of course, unless you actually try and do it, you don't know whether the thing is, and ask it, like, hey, are you conscious? And the thing says, yes, I am. Um, but of course, it might say that, and we'll come back to this later on when we look at Chalmers' zombie argument, which is structurally identical to this. Uh, it's, a, it's a general move that Bloch is one of the first to make against the functionalist claim. If you're just describing all mentality by causal roles um, and mediation of those roles, then it seems like a system could do all of that and yet not have the relevant mental states, especially phenomenal states, like what it's like to see red or something. Um, so I just want you to think about this uh, thought experiment um, and his, uh, basically the objection is, look, it doesn't seem like there'd be anything it's like to be that uh, system. Um, you can go over those slides yourselves and we'll talk about them more. But that's the objection. We'll come back to that objection. We'll talk more about it, especially when we get to Chalmers. Uh, but when we come back, we'll talk about the, uh, the causal theory, which kind of gets back to a type of identity theory.